Good morning. It's Teresa in the garden for Acts chapter 19. You might wonder why I have this headband on. We're going to learn in just a short time. We are back with Paul and he is teaching us some things today that we need to learn about casting out demons and about getting along with people and doing things in a legal manner. But we start out with chapter 19 saying, while Apollos was in Corinth, remember last week we left off with a man named Apollos that didn't know the full story and Aquila and Priscilla gave him the full story and then he went on to be a very fine preacher of the gospel. While he was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. We're going to look at the map here. So, Paul is in Ephesus right here. He had traveled from Corinth to Ephesus and he found about 12 men that were followers of John the Baptist. John the Baptist had followers that existed all the way into the second century. Those people who did not know the complete work of Jesus on the cross. And when he met them, he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we haven't even heard about a Holy Spirit. What's a Holy Spirit? Then Paul asked them, well, what kind of baptism did you experience? And they replied, the baptism of John. Remember, John had a baptism of repentance. But Jesus' baptism gave them the power of the Holy Spirit to operate to spread the gospel. So there's two parts to salvation and receiving the Holy Spirit and then receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. But these men had not even received the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. John's baptism looked forward to Jesus coming, and Jesus' baptism, getting the Holy Spirit, involved recognizing what was done on the cross by him. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Paul laid his hands on him, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. And there were about 12 men in all. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon people and gave them the ability to praise God in an unknown language. This was an evidence that the Holy Spirit actually had come upon them. When you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, that's when you receive the power to use the gifts that the Holy Spirit brings. And it's two separate things. And a lot of people have salvation through Jesus Christ, but they've never been empowered to preach the gospel by using the gifts the Holy Spirit gives them. So it's an important thing to have the complete indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it was important that when the apostles came, that's when the Holy Spirit was indwelling inside a person. And this gave credence to the belief that the Holy Spirit was real, that speaking in tongues and prophesying, which means praising the Lord or being able to speak the Word of God, that was an important thing. But the Holy Spirit also united all the church as one church. So it had a twofold effect there in, in doing power on people to preach the gospel and also to unite them as one body. And that evidence of tongues and prophesying at this time in history was important to show that it was true. Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months. Now we're talking about the synagogue there in Ephesus. I wanna tell you about Ephesus. I told you about Corinth 
and it was a sexual hubbub of all kinds of orgies and things that were happening, Ephesus was a little bit different in that Ephesus had a temple in it called the Temple of Artemis. Artemis by the Greeks and uh, Diana, no, Diana by the Greeks and Artemis by the, um, for some reason, it's just totally going out of my brain. Artemis was also the same as the goddess of Diana. <clears throat> the Romans, <laughs> the Romans called her Diana and the Greeks called her Artemis. I might have that backwards. It doesn't matter. She's the same goddess, and she was a goddess that was supposed to have fallen from the sky, and where she fell, that's where they created a temple, and this was north of Ephesus. Now, meteorites were used in the worship of Artemis or Diana, and so it's believed that it was a meteorite that fell from the sky, and the people started worshiping her, and her image was a multi-breasted goddess. She was a, a goddess of fertility and nurturing. Some showed her as the goddess of the hunt. Women would call upon her name when they wanted to get pregnant, and they depended on Artemis to bring them prosperity in their businesses. And Ephesus was a the capital, the Roman capital of this area, but people would travel from all over to come to Ephesus to worship in the temple of Artemis. There were orgies at her festivals, and we're going to learn about a festival that happened and a riot that happened at that festival pertaining to Paul here in just a few minutes. But I want you to understand it was a, a hubbub of commerce and religious activity, but it was idol worship and people would come to visit the temple of Artemis, and there were silversmiths that would make little statues of the temple and, and images of Artemis, and people would take them home and set them up in their homes as a place to worship Artemis in their home. So Paul went to the synagogue to preach to the Jewish people like he usually did, and he was in this synagogue for three months. And he was persuasively trying to show them how the prophecies had pointed to Jesus. Jesus had came, he had been crucified and resurrected, and they needed to worship him as Messiah. But some became stubborn, rejecting Paul's message, and publicly started speaking against the way. Remember, that was what the Christian church was called, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So these were believers in the way. And some of these Jewish people dug their heels in and said, no, we're not going to accept this. So they started speaking publicly against Paul. And he left the synagogue. But just like last time when he was in Corinth and the synagogue was making it hard for him, he went right next door to Titus Justice and started preaching. He now goes very near the synagogue to a place called Tyrannus's Hall. Uh, some people believe Tyrannus was a Jewish rabbi that had a private synagogue in this hall. Other people believe he was secular and that he taught religious, he taught philosophy there. But he would teach from early in the morning until about 11 in the afternoon. And from 11 until 4, it was in the heat of the day. The sun is coming out here, <clears throat> and it's getting warmer. A lot of times when the sun comes out and it gets hot, people run into their houses for shelter. They do this in Mexico and in a lot of other places where it gets hot during the heat of the day. They take naps, they eat food, and they rest. And then they come back out later on in the afternoon and continue their work until evening. And that's what they did here in Ephesus. And so this hall was used in the morning, from early morning until 11, and then from 4 until evening for philosophical teachings or debates 
or maybe even other things. We don't know exactly for sure, but we do know that Paul was able, whether he rented out this hall or whatever, he was able to use it to preach the word of God. And there were people in Ephesus that were so hungry for this teaching. Some Jews that he had converted in the synagogue, some God-fearers, some non-Jewish people that had become believers followed him. And they would come during the heat of the day and they would sit there and they would listen to Paul teach about Jesus and the ways that Jesus taught when he was here on earth. He held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. By the way, Tyrannus means tyrant. And there's a lot of people that believed that Tyrannus' students called him Tyrannus because he was a tyrant. Do you know anyone like that? Paul taught for the next two years in this hall of Tyrannus so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Greeks and Jews, heard the word of the Lord. People would come to worship Artemis. They would hear about Paul teaching. They were curious. They would go see what it was all about. They would become believers, and then they would go back to their countries. The same thing happened at Pentecost when the believers, when people came there for Pentecost and they heard Peter and the other disciples preaching. They went back to their places where they lived and they started sharing what they learned about Jesus. And that's how churches started in places that Paul had never even been. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles at different times during his ministry. And in this culture here in Ephesus, it was very superstitious. And so people started getting Paul's handkerchiefs. I have one around my head. They were also called sweatbands. Paul was a tent maker, remember? And so during the early morning hours until 11, he was busy making tents and he would have his sweatband on. So any sweat that came from his head would be caught with the sweatband. I use sweatbands sometimes when I'm out here working in my garden in Texas heat. Uh, Paul also had an apron that he would put on, and this apron would keep him cleaner so that he could go and teach in Tyrannius' hall. So when his hands got dirty with dyes and things, he would wipe his hands on his apron. A lot of times women use aprons when they're in the kitchen cooking so they don't get their clothes dirty. And they would a lot of times take these sweatbands and these aprons off at the end of the day because they were so dirty they couldn't be used again. Well, people would collect Paul's headbands, his handkerchiefs, and his aprons, and they would take them home to people that were sick and lay them on the sick people. And God anointed Paul so much that his sweat was even sanctified and these people would be healed. Some people believe that Paul's shadow, if it fell on them, would heal them. The same happened with Peter because people's beliefs are very, very powerful. So when you start ministering to someone that has a very powerful superstitious belief, Rather than preaching against their beliefs, just preach about Jesus and what he has, the power the Holy Spirit has. But scripture tells us when handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched Paul's skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled from them. Ephesus was a place that was known for exorcisms. So a group of Jews were traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. This was very normal there. Remember Simon Mangus that Peter and Philip came across when they were there in, um, I believe it was Caesarea. Simon was wanting to buy the power of the Holy Spirit because all of his followers were starting to follow Philip and Peter, and he wanted his power back. Well, this group of Jews, they were Jewish men, were traveling around, casting out demons and devils. 
And if you got the name of a demon that was more powerful than the demon that was in a person and you use that demon's name, the lesser demon would have to run away. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantations, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. These were seven sons of a man named Sceva, and he claimed to be a high priest, but his name was never written in the Jewish records of high priest. Simon Mangus also claimed to be God in a bottle, but he wasn't. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this, but one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus. And I know Paul, but who are you? <laughs> then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such a violent force that they fled from the house naked and battered. You see, Jesus' name isn't to be used like a magical incantation. That's what these people did. They had magical incantations. They used magic. Ephesus was known for its magic. But magic only has a wee bit of power. And it's sent by Satan. And people who go to fortune tellers and people who do horoscopes and, and all those kind of... Um, uh, Superstitions can have some truth to them, but they can also lead you astray very easily because that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to hook you with a little bit of power or a little bit of truth and destroy your life. Only Jesus has the power to truly heal. Only Jesus has the power to deliver you from anything you've gotten into that you need to get out of. And if you're into any of those things, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, you pray and ask the Holy Spirit to deliver you from the effects and the consequences that will come from that. Because there are great consequences, just like these men here were experiencing. You have to have a relationship with Jesus to be able to use the power of the Holy Spirit. These men were trying to use the name of Jesus without having to have without having a relationship or receiving the Holy Spirit. The story of what happened spread quickly throughout all of Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. I wonder if those seven sons of Sceva confessed their sin. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them in a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. There was a time in my life that God showed me that the tarot cards I was practicing with and the past life regressions and the crystal healings, and I was into all kinds of new age stuff. And God showed me it was not him. And a very kind pastor that actually he and I were born on the same day. He helped me get delivered from those things. And I went home and I burned about $500 worth of books that I had on all these things. Books on astrology. Booked on, books on tarot readings. Book, my tarot cards. All the things that I had been using to give me uh, power and to be used as a divination tool. I burned them. Uh, these people burned them publicly so that they would have each other to um, hold each other accountable not to go back in their sin again. There were a lot of people that were delivered that day. So the message about the Lord spread widely, and it had a very powerful effect. Afterwards, Paul felt compelled by the Spirit to go over to Macedonia and Achaia before going to Jerusalem. So we're going to look that back here at our map. So he leaves Ephesus and he goes back through Philippi and Thessalonica and down to Athens and Corinth 
because he feels like he needs to go back there and strengthen the churches. And he had written 1 Corinthians to the church in Corinth because of the divisions, but there were other things that were going on there. And he wanted to go back and strengthen those churches. And then he said, I must go to Jerusalem, and after that I must go to Rome. He sent his two assistants, Timothy and Erastius, ahead through that area of Macedonia because he was going to collect an offering to take back to the poor church in Jerusalem. The, the church in Jerusalem was very, very poor. The believers there were very poor. Many of them had been officials in the church. They had gotten kicked out. In the synagogue, they had gotten kicked out when they became believers. And so the church in Jerusalem was the poorest church. Ephesus was very rich. Corinth was very rich. Athens, Thessalonica, all these areas of Macedonia, Timothy and Erastus went ahead to prepare them and tell them when Paul comes, he's going to be taking a collection to take back to Jerusalem. So get ready. About that time, there was some serious trouble that developed in Ephesus concerning the way. And it began with a man named Demetrius. He was a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess, goddess of Artemis, which I was telling you about earlier. He kept many craftsmen busy. <clears throat> they made a lot of money off of these idols. He called them together along with others employed in similar praids, trades, making idols, stone idols, and wooden idols, and addressed them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And that's true. They weren't. They had eyes that couldn't see, ears that couldn't hear, couldn't deliver people when they got in bondage with evil spirits, and they couldn't heal them either. He said all he's done this, all He's done not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province teaching this heresy that is, is going to put us out of business. Of course, I'm not talking just about the loss of public respect for our business. So he's trying to schmooze it over now because he doesn't want people to realize He's really just interested in lining his pocket with the money that people are going to give him when they buy these idols. He says, I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, would be robbed of her great prestige. So he's trying to appeal to their religiousness in their worship of Artemis. And this happened actually during the religious festival that they would have each year for Artemis. So it had more impact. At this, their anger boiled and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was filled with confusion and everyone rushed into the amphitheater. Th this amphitheater could hold 25,000 people. And they drug along Gaius and Aristarchus, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. So Paul had come back to Ephesus and he wanted to go in there too and defend the faith. But some of the officials in the province who were high officials, not less, not just, they weren't believers, but they were friends of Paul. They sent him a message begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Both Jesus and Paul were willing to lose their life for the sake of spreading the gospel. But Paul didn't go because he got held back. <clears throat> Inside, the people were all shouting the same thing. Everyone was in confusion. You know when riots happen? A lot of times there's people there that don't even know why they're there. They're just there being along with everybody else because it's something to do. In fact, most of them didn't know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd, the Jews in the crowd were afraid that this mob would jump on the Jews because there was enough anti-Semitism 
or people that were against the Jews already in Ephesus. And they wanted to make sure that this group did not jump on the Jewish culture there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander forward and told him to explain the situation. He motions for silence and tried to speak. But when the crowd realized he was a Jew, they started shouting again and kept it up for two hours saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Ephesus was known for the temple of Artemis. They had a lot of uh, political clout because of this Artemis worship. Um, Texas is known for everything being bigger in Texas. There's different states that are known for different things. Ephesus was like the New York City is to the United States. And so people would go to Ephesus because it was the end thing to do. And they would worship this goddess named F um, Artemis. At last, the mayor of the town was able to get them to quiet down. And he spoke and said, citizens of Ephesus, everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven. Since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm and do not do anything rash. You have brought these men, he's talking about Gaius and Aristoshas, Paul's traveling companions, You've brought these men here, but they haven't stolen anything from the temple and have not spoken against our goddess. Paul didn't speak against Artemis. He spoke in favor of Jesus. And that's a really important thing to remember when you are speaking to someone of a different faith or a different religion. Don't put down their faith in religion. Just tell them what Jesus has done for them and how much Jesus loved them, even to the point that he gave his life so that they could be with God forever. It's a good thing to learn. I told y'all we was gonna be learning a lot of things today. If Demetrius and the craftsmen actually have a good case against them, the courts are in session and the officials can hear the case at once. Let them make a formal charge in the right way. And if there are any complaints about other matters, they can be settled in a legal assembly. You see, this assembly was not legal. And this city mayor knew it. And other officials, the one that didn't want Paul to go there. Because if Paul went there, it would have just been like throwing fuel on a fire. The Roman government would take people out that were in charge of keeping peace in these Roman provinces. That was their job. This mayor's job was on the line. If he didn't keep the peace in this city, the Roman government would depose him, take him out of the position he had. They could also put the whole city under martial law and take away a lot of their rights. And so this mayor was trying as hard as he could to get them to present their case in a non-riotous way. He said, I'm afraid we're in danger of being charged with rioting by the Roman government since there is no cause for this commotion. He knew there was no cause for this. And he said, if Rome demands an explanation, we won't know what to say. Then he dismissed them and they all dispersed. It's important if you have a grievance against someone else, to first take it before the Lord and ask Him if it's a true grievance. And if it is, He will give you the right words to say to the right person at the right time to prove your grievance is real or to prove you are innocent or whatever it is that you need to bring forth. If you trust God to defend you, if you make way for the wrath of the Lord, you're covered. And if you don't, you just get might, might get yourself taken out. I love you very much. Next week, we're going to learn more about when Paul goes to Macedonia and Greece. It's going to be good. So I hope you can join us next week. Until then... Make sure you take your grievances to the Lord 
so that you can get the peace that surpasses understanding. And also get direction about how to air your griefs. Nothing you do or think is in secret. Everything will be shouted to the rooftops. Remember that.